Maryland movie. Um, and then I go to a Maryland movie theater, a United flight, and I try to give the mundane realities of emergency response uh, its due. You know, the, um, um, a lot of what distinguishes an excellent response to a person in behavioral crisis and, uh, and a not so excellent response ends up being very much related to something very mundane about, about uh, the procedures and the people available to help when that person uh, is, is in difficulty. And in our work, um, uh, largely due to my colleague, Andrea Tentner, who's uh, an amazing data scientist, who's, who's the first author on our first paper from this, uh, we like to talk about person-based, place-based, and event-based strategies to improve emergency response that, that, that address those realities, and how we can maybe, maybe could use administrative data to do a better job. And, uh, and so I'll tell you more about that. Can folks hear me okay? Um, Harold, can you hear me? I, I don't think yes. we're, we're seeing the slides advance. We're still on slide one. You're still on slide one. Yeah. Well, slide one was the best slide, but uh, <laughs> well, let's see if, uh, um, let's see if we can, uh, this is such a classic Zoom moment. Okay, let's, um, let's see if this works. What, are you seeing slides advance now? No, they're not, they're not moving. That is really, really uh, upsetting. Let's see. Um, uh, uh, goodness sake. I have, um, what are you, uh, What are you seeing now on the screen? I see slide four. So shall I, are you now seeing the beginning? Yes. Okay, so let me just honor, uh, these, are, these are our colleagues. Uh, by the way, I wanna mention a, a couple of people on this list, Jessica Smith, Atassi and, and uh, Luberta Livingston. When, uh, we did some outreach work, which I'll describe in a bit. And, and these are outreach, this is outreach work of people that we identified through statistical modeling as being potentially at risk of having a violent encounter with first responders. And I sort of wanted LeBron James to be my outreach worker because we were going out to people in the community or in their home uh, who might have posed a risk, you know, uh, and, uh, but, you know, LeBron wasn't available, uh, especially on our budget. So instead, we had a lady who was a 67-year-old uh, grandmother and she was phenomenal. And it's actually much better than having a sort of very physically formidable old man. Uh, and the, our two outreach workers were just amazing. Uh, but uh, many, many people on this list uh, played a big role. Uh, I'm just gonna go to, uh, are you, I'm going to the slideshow mode. Are you, are you still, are you seeing uh, my action-packed roadmap slide now? Yes, we're good. Perfect. So I think I've already described what's on this, uh, but I'll say, we think a lot about person-based, place-based, and event-based strategies to improve emergency response. There are particular people that you're worried about because they had a, a problematic encounter in the past. There's a place where there have been a lot of issues, and that place sort of comes in two varieties. There's the high-volume place and the high-risk place. So the high-volume place might be the bus station. And, and at the bus station, there's a staff, you can actually do some proactive training of the security staff, security staff, other people to understand how to deal with issues that may arise. There's also uh, the private residence where someone is, uh, is at risk and where we've been before, or maybe a group home or some other congregate facility like that where it's, it's small, but it's, it's high risk. And then there's also event-based strategies where there's something that's happening that makes you particularly worried in that moment. Uh, uh, and so we think about these three different types of issues and three different potentially uh, classes of strategies to try to identify and, and address uh, emergency responses. And as I mentioned, we use uh, linked administrative data to try to learn about these things. Okay. So um, uh, I must say that one of the first things that 
that I've learned on this project is, uh, let me just smoothing the uh, menu out of the way. The first thing that I learned is how much we put onto first responders. You know, if, the, if a police officer responds to a call and it does not go well, uh, you know, that is, there's just an incredible toll on the police department, on that individual officer. And, uh, and it's definitely important to help police officers respond better to crises. And, uh, you know, and, and I'll talk some about that. Uh, but boy, we expect an awful lot from police and we expect an awful little from some of the other systems that often uh, are, are trying to assist the same people in places and prevent the same kind of events that I mentioned on the last slide. Uh, you know, by the time someone calls the police department, it makes a 911 call, be, something has really happened that suggests that the situation has escalated. And who, you know, where's the prevention component? Where's the follow-up prevention if there've been previous issues? I really feel for the first responders, police and fire particularly. Uh, I should say also that people typically describe these as uh, related to serious mental illness. And sometimes these behavioral crises reflect severe mental illness, but they can reflect many other things as well. Partly, of course, it could be acute intoxication. Alcohol is, of course, a big role and plays a big role in a lot of uh, these kinds of behavioral crises. Could be other things too. Uh, uh, it could be someone who has an intellectual or developmental disability or many other causes that just lead people to behave in an unexpected way, to be non-compliant with first responders' instructions, to become verbally aggressive. Uh, many different reasons that lead people to have these sorts of behaviors and crises that don't always reflect a particular stereotypical image of serious mental illness. Uh, I should also say that we, we have tools, and I think in California, the tools are used better than they are in Illinois. Uh, we have some tools to help people who are at these sorts of risks, but we don't use these tools as well as we should. And, uh, you know, Medicaid is clearly the major tool that we have to provide a lot of the services that are needed and the oversight that's needed. Uh, but I, I think that if I were to, uh, uh, if I could get all the people in the same room, I would have the people from Medi-Cal, uh, you know, in the room with the people, with the first responders and saying, you know, how can we, how can we address this in a unified way? Uh, there, um, um, so say, and I, I already gave you my uh, sort of trigger warning uh, comment. Uh, there, um, uh, now let me say some things about stereotypes about, about mental illness. Uh, there are some horrible stereotypes about people who live with mental illness, which tend to resurface every time there's some sort of a rampage killing. Uh, you know, whenever someone commits a mass homicide, uh, we see politicians saying, this is a mental health problem, this is a mental illness problem. And that is, that is uh, not a very good way to think about these issues. First of all, if we look at uh, data on stranger violence in the United States, very, very little of it is attributable to people with serious mental illness. The epidemiological catchment area study uh, found that people with serious mental illness account for maybe 4% of reported violence in the United States. And when people do have serious mental illness, most of the time, uh, dual diagnosis is playing a role, that people are often intoxicated. And uh, so, so there are, you know, many of our friends and neighbors live with a serious mental illness. And it is extremely unfair to view those uh, women and men and loved ones that, in our lives as people you know, through the prism of their potential for violence. Uh, and in fact, if you look, for example, Stedman and colleagues did a study of individuals who are discharged from acute civil inpatient settings. And uh, only 6% of those individuals committed a violent act against a stranger and actually only nine out of the 951 committed a violent act with a gun against a stranger. And this is really, these were people that were very, very seriously mentally ill. Okay. Um, now, having said that, I should say that the debunking narrative, what I just gave you is a little bit facile as well for the following reason. If you actually look at uh, the full context of the lives of, of people, uh, 
There is a real risk of violence, but it is almost always directed at family members, romantic partners, or other intimates. And it turns out that 28% of the patients that I just described committed at least one act of violence or threatened violence after they were discharged. Uh, and uh, so, the, so, the, so the issues of violence are there, but they're not the ones that people are most worried about in the public discourse. It's often what's happening in the family home. And I should say, this is not unique to serious mental illness. My wife and I take care of uh, her brother uh, who lives with a genetic disorder called Fragile X Syndrome. And uh, he is a 260 pound gentleman. He's actually quite uh, gentle and we, we have a wonderful relationship with him. He's not violent in any way. Uh, but about a third of parent caregivers for young men with Fragile X Syndrome are regularly injured by their sons. And uh, very often families face a very difficult decision Am I going to call law enforcement or other first responders uh, if I'm afraid for my safety or the safety of my loved one? And you know, families really need the confidence that they can call if they need it. Uh, I did a study actually of 40 uh, caregivers of Fragile X and, and I would talk to people, mostly middle-aged women about my age, and, and some of them had really been hurt by their sons and were very, very nervous about calling the police. Uh, you know, in those kinds of situations, and I'll and I'll uh, I'll come back to that. Uh, so, you know, part of the issue of training first responders and having a good first response system is to make is to assure the safety of an individual who might have a behavioral crisis. But another part of it is to assure everyone else in that ecosystem, hey, you can get help if you need it. If you know, if there's if there is an issue like that, uh, there. Um, uh, so, so here I'm, I'm going to tell you a couple of anecdotes. This is sort of there's nothing horrible in this, but it, but no harm, no foul. If this is the moment that you want to go get your cup of coffee. Um, so first of all, as, as Janie knows very well, I, I actually got involved in this issue uh, around the time in Chicago that Laquan McDonald was shot uh, uh, in, in the city, and one of the ironies of the Laquan McDonald situation is a young man. Uh, who, who, who had a variety of significant uh, uh, mental and developmental issues. Uh, and he was, uh, and he became, uh, you know, agitated and so on. He was walking down the street. He actually had a knife, although the only thing that he injured with his knife was the tire on a police car. Uh, and he was uh, being followed by a, uh, a sort of a phalanx of police officers who basically cornered him in uh, in an area where he was away from every from other people and he was he was, he was as far away from the officers and and the situation there's, there's a little bit of detail and complication I won't go into but basically they were waiting for some additional equipment to, to see how they could uh, uh, take him into custody safely and the entire episode if you ever watch that videotape up until Officer Jason Van Dyke jumps out and pumps 16 shots into Laquan McDonald, it could be a training tape for how to do this right and how to give him distance, give him time to calm down, call for help. Uh, but Laquan McDonald is shot and killed by uh, Jason Van Dyke. Uh, and uh, in a very tragic situation that led to a variety of reforms in Chicago in policing. Uh, Janie, did I did I just miss any critical details in that story that should be related? No, I think you captured it well. Thanks. Uh, and it's a really tragic thing because, by the way, all the officers who did it right, many of them lied about what happened and and support and backed up a deceptive story about the officer, which is a whole other aspect of it, which which was problematic, of course. Uh, Another thing that happened was the case of, of Quintonio LeGreer and Betty Jones, where Quintonio LeGreer is a young man who, experience, was, who was experiencing uh, very serious mental health problems. And, and, he, and he was basically trying to get at his, his father, who was locked in, a room, locked in a room in his house. And Quintonio LeGreer actually called 911 a couple of times and was hung up on. Uh, and... Uh, and officers eventually responded to the call when, the, when his father called. Again, I'm leaving out a lot of details. And LeGreer charged the officers with a bat and the officer uh, fired at him and killed him. 
and also in the in the shooting of Betty Jones, who was a uh, who lived in the same building, what was killed by a stray stray bullet, and uh, that was also a very tragic case, and it led to. Um, a whole series of reforms. And in, in my case, I became involved in one of the working groups on something called the Police Accountability Task Force, where, where I was trying to help Chicago uh, both identify training opportunities and also identify other ways we could assist people with mental health uh, challenges more effectively. Uh, so that's, uh, this is kind of a standard story that many of you have thought about. Here's another story. This is Robert Saylor. He's a 26-year-old uh, young man. Uh, Living with Down syndrome, and and uh, and and one night he uh, he went to the movies. He had this young woman who was a caretaker uh, for him, you know, a caregiver who was who was uh, a teenager who took him to the movies. And so he goes to the movies, and the movie ends, and uh, and then he starts getting very agitated, and the young woman who. Uh, uh, who was with him, uh, who I believe is named Patty Smith. I'm actually blanking. I think I'm name is slightly wrong, but I'll say Patty Smith. Uh, Patty Smith calls his mom and she says, you know, he's just, he's just really agitated. And uh, what should I do? And, and, and Sailor's mom says, I'll tell you what, I'm going to go and um, I'll get in the car, I'll come down and see what I can do to help. Why don't you go and get the car, pull it around. And maybe while you're doing that, he'll kind of settle down and then, uh, you know, we'll get him home. And so Patty Smith goes and she gets the car and she drives it around and she comes back into the lobby where he was and she discovers that he'd actually uh, gone back into the theater to watch. He wanted to watch the movie again and he went and he sat down in his original seat and that's why he was so agitated. And the manager was in there and he was getting into it with Mr. Saylor because you, because you can't just go back in, you have to buy another ticket. And so, so Smith go, you know, Ms. Smith goes in and she talks to the manager and she says, uh, don't touch him, kind of get, you know, he's going to get all agitated. Just give him a little bit of space. We'll figure out what to do. And the manager looks at her and he's basically like, I'm like, am I going to let this, uh, you know, 19 year old young woman tell me how to do my job? He, he, he starts arguing with Mr. Saylor and then he calls mall security. And mall security comes over and it's, it's three off duty sheriff's deputies from, you know, who are county sheriffs. And, Smith again says to them, you know, don't touch him, whatever, you know, he's, um, uh, uh, you know, it, it, he's just, it's just going to escalate things. And the officers shoo her away and they basically start arguing with him and they tell him if he doesn't come with them that they're going to arrest him. And they extricate him from the chair and, uh, and Sailor's mom arrives just in time to see that he's been on the floor prone and the deputies are on top of him and that he had just died of asphyxiation. Uh, men with Down syndrome have a particular vulnerability due to, due to some, some more sort of morphological issues, but they had tried to restrain him prone and he's a strong young man and, uh, and in the struggle, uh, he died. And the officers were actually charged with homicide in the case. And one of the striking things in the case is, first of all, the judge said this person died over a $12 movie ticket, uh, you know, this is, ridiculous but the officer's successful defense was that they had followed their training and that the training was you keep escalating the use of force until you secure compliance uh, by uh, by the person who is who is fighting with you you know or who is who is disobeying you a sailor had he was sitting in this chair he was not a threat to anybody but he was but he was uh, you know arguing with them he was being defiant uh, and they tried to to gain his uh, compliance by force uh, and I should say that, as I mentioned, this is a very common issue among people with developmental disabilities. Uh, when I was, the people that I was talking to in the study that I described, very often when the tape recorder would be turned off, parents would start to talk to me about some of the challenges they had. And so one of the respondents told me, you know, he's not aggressive or violent just for the sake of it, uh, but I, I know what triggers it. I spend the vast majority of my uh, days working around knowing how to prevent something like that from happening. She had, she had a, uh, a bruise. And then there was another respondent who had, who had uh, been pushed down the stairs. And, and I said to her, you know, why, why is he living with you in your home? And she said, all the places that I would like for him to go, they won't take him because of these behaviors. 
And the places that will take him, they've got other young men who have the same issue. Uh, and so it's not fun for me, but I would rather have him in my house. You know, I know how to deal with it. And, uh, it's, you know, this is, this is my life. And, uh, and it was just, I'm struck by how many other people, that story that I told you about Mr. Saylor, has anyone on this, uh, in the audience heard this story before? Am I into reruns here? I don't know if anyone, uh, I can't see the chat box, but did it, has it, does anyone familiar with this story? Um, there, uh, I, can someone, can someone look at the chat box and see if there's a, I can't, uh, I don't, I don't think anyone, anyone is familiar with it uh, so far. Yeah. Uh, uh, got you. Uh, yeah. there, um, I can tell you that if you had a son with this issue, you would be in a Facebook group where either this story or something like it got your attention and where people had, you know, where parents were talking about it and siblings were talking about it. The, um, uh, so, uh, um, and I know my wife, after this happened, we were sitting over breakfast and she just said, in a very matter of fact way, she just said, by the way, never ever call the police if my brother uh, is hurting me. I would rather that he hurt me than that the police come and, and then I have no idea what's gonna happen. And uh, you know, this is just a common, uh, this is just what a lot of families are dealing with. Uh, so here's another story. How many of you have heard this story? The man at, on United Airlines who was, uh, uh, who was removed forcibly at O'Hare Airport from a flight. Anybody hear this story? Dr. David Dow. This one is much more well known. So, you know, what's striking about this story, let me just get back up. Uh, and the most common reaction that I have heard to this story from people is, wow, United Airlines has really crappy service. Uh, you know, this, he's basically, there was a guy, he was on a flight and there was no, uh, there was a question, he, he was bumped from the flight and, this, and he refused to leave and the police came on and when he wouldn't leave, they dragged him off. And as you can see, uh, he was hurt. And, uh, uh, and, you know, from my perspective in the work that I do, I really don't care whether uh, he should, whether he, 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 the argument was he was, that was a legit ticket or it wasn't a legit ticket. And from my perspective, it doesn't matter. One of the most dangerous things that law enforcement officers can do is to try to remove someone from a chair. And you know, once you put your hands on somebody, uh, you know, anything can happen. And here they, you know, imagine how different the story would have gone if the officers had just said to this gentleman, you know, I'm not gonna manhandle you to get you off this flight. Uh, of course, if you don't get off the flight, you may be barred from United Airlines for the rest of your life or whatever. That's, that's not on me. Is there someone else, is there someone else here who'd be willing to take a thousand dollars to take a later flight? I guarantee you there was a, there would be a U of C student or somebody who would be happy to have jumped at that. Uh, and you know, this is a de-escalation issue uh, in the same way that these other issues were de-escalation issues. David Dow wasn't, wasn't a person with mental illness, but he was being disobedient in a situation where uh, the use of force uh, was unsafe and avoidable. Uh, and so, uh, so that's an important uh, limitation in the way that, 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 they, that they responded. Uh, now, some specific training would have helped in these situations. Uh, by the way, one thing that does not help in these situations is training officers to do mental health or developmental disability diagnoses. It turns out that that, that's, that information just doesn't help officers respond more effectively. They need to be aware that people have those diagnoses that could lead to these behaviors, but not in the moment to try to diagnose them. Uh, there, uh, so one of the things that my colleague, uh, Tony Sadler and I have spent some time on this, uh, trying to look at what, what is effective in training. And it turns out that, that the most effective thing in police training uh, are just three simple principles, time, distance, and cover. You give a person time to calm down. You stay physically distant from them so that, the, so that they're far away from, from you or from anyone else who might get hurt. Uh, and you take cover if you need to. And it turns out that that is 85% uh, of the situations, that's the way police should behave. You know, if someone continues to be violent and they don't calm down, you can get other people to help you. It's actually a lot easier to be gentle if you have 
five people than if you have two people uh, when someone is, is dysregulated. Uh, or you could get a loved one who, who could talk to the person. When there's time, you typically have many more resources to deal with something. Uh, there are some particular issues. You never want to restrain someone face down. Prone restraints are, are uh, basically uh, uh, not allowed in a lot of uh, mental health facilities where restraints are sometimes required. There's, there's very serious health risks with prone restraint. And also just telling people that stereotypical presentations of mental illness are only one cause of a behavioral crisis. And you're not always going to recognize when someone has an issue uh, that makes it hard for you to, uh, uh, to understand why they're behaving the way that they do. And, and one of the ironies in this work is that if, if a sort of a middle-aged dude my age with some razor stubble and you know, some gray hair and is, uh, starts talking to Jesus at uh, uh, two o'clock in the afternoon in, uh, in the middle of uh, uh, you know, the uptown neighborhood of Chicago, uh, police are going to be really good at using this training well because that person fits kind of a stereotypical image maybe that guy's a vet uh if onlookers see the police being very gentle with that person there's a very positive public perception of that um it's kind of and also it's if it's two o'clock in the afternoon in a low crime neighborhood you have a lot of time uh to deal with it uh other situations are more challenging if he's a young muscular man of color who's behaving the same way, it's harder for police to respond in quite the same way for all sorts of complicated reasons. Uh, and, uh, um, uh, and that's where, that's where I, I um, mentioned the mundane, the mundane realities of, of policing must be given their due. Uh, I also think, by the way, public policy needs to catch up. Uh, one of the things that we are very interested in is sending out uh, assertive community treatment teams to help people who are at risk of a behavioral crisis. And it turns out if you have schizoaffective disorder, Medicaid will pay for ACT for you. But if you just have an alcohol disorder, you behave in the same way, Medicaid will not pay for assertive community treatment for you, even if you need some of the same services, because it's the, di the reimbursement is based on the diagnosis, not on the behavioral risk that we're most worried about. Uh, okay, are we, am I talking too fast? Is there something I can do to improve your listening pleasure? It's kind of weird not to be able to see people. Please let me know if there's something I'm doing that I could be doing better. We can hear you just fine. Professor, I just wanted to, uh, if people have questions, if, they, if you want them to just interrupt or raise your hand, it's, it's up to you. Yeah, please uh, uh, feel free to ask a question. Shall we pause for questions? Feel free to ask them now. All I see is positive affirmation. But clearly, we're not in Chicago. Uh, uh, so uh, I'll continue going. Uh, so what are some opportunities for intervention? As I mentioned, uh, and maybe someone could raise their hand and Anna or Janie could just interrupt me if, uh, if there's a, a question that's appropriate. Uh, so person-based interventions are, we identify that you are at risk for uh, uh, and you have particular needs as an individual. And we can send interventions to help you like assertive community treatment or it's criminal justice variant, a forensic assertive community treatment, which has more of a sort of directed uh, and, and uh, a little bit less voluntary approach to uh, ACT. There's event-based intervention, which is say, say there's a phone call that's made to the 911 system and keywords are used in that call that make us think, oh, we're really concerned about this. Uh, this, you know, it's check day and there's, keywords that are used that suggest people are fighting about money. And then we can send police officers to that call who have been trained in a CIT, uh, you know, as mental health training for these types of situations, the crisis intervention team, the crisis intervention training. And there's also place-based interventions, as I've mentioned, where we can be alert to specific places and interact with those places. I should say, again, drawing on my own experience as a caregiver, my brother-in-law has been assaulted four times over the past 15 years. I don't believe that there has ever been follow-up from any county, city, or state agency to look at what were the circumstances in the group home that led, I, I actually totally understood in three of those four cases what had happened, and just another resident who had a disagreement with him. Uh, and 
you know, there was, I can't say that I, that I've ever had any kind of follow-up that was place-based to say, how could we manage these incidents better when people with adult sized bodies and child size ability to manage conflict are, are you know, living in the same uh, very close quarters. And the, by the way, this obvious analytic questions about how these three categories may overlap are the place-based interventions, are the people that are involved in those also the people we would identify through person-based interventions, things like that. So we're obviously looking at those questions. Uh, let me say uh, uh, in the, quickly in the place-based arena, uh, we do think that there's opportunities for dedicated training and, and uh, sort of wargaming out. A lot of the situations in Chicago are in, uh, in particular places that are known by the fire department and others to be at risk. One of the amusing things about this work was that we would describe, we'd go to the fire department and we would describe people and we would just fuzz up all the cases. And we had all these statistical models and we'd say, a person I'll call John Smith and uh, who, who, uh, uh, who had X happen to him and, and then somebody in the audience would say, isn't that that guy in the red jacket who's like always on the blue line? And uh, you, know, that, you know that guy that we're talking about. People say, yeah, that's gotta be him. And you know, Chicago turns out to be a small town in a way that was, uh, that was humbling. Also, we had all of these statistical models that were based on zip code and we would show up and the EMTs would say, dude, there's nothing interesting happening in that zip code. That's the end of the red line. You know, that's, uh, I can tell you very well, none of the people that these calls involve live in that zip code. They're just, they're just asleep and it got to the end of the line. Uh, we also found uh, particular high volume locations like homeless shelters. One of the, some of the homeless shelters actually could escalate risk by queuing first responders for a, um, a threat that was not there. So they, one, a common call that would come from a homeless shelter would be a uh, man with schizophrenia has uh, a health problem. And and so there would be a response that would be thinking that, that there was someone having a psychotic issue. And they would walk into the homeless shelter and there would be a man who lives with schizophrenia, but then he'd lift up his foot and he'd say, yeah, I've got this toe fungus and I've got to go to the county hospital and, and the shelter, you know, the, you know, that has to be done by ambulance here. So, uh, you know, some training with, uh, and the, of course the ambulance people were, are not happy when things like that happen. Um, and I, uh, there's also uh, how we could do a better job with these high risk but smaller locations. One of the things that, that we're gonna try to do over the next year is to try to help people enroll in the smart 911 system so that if say I have someone in my home with a particular issue, I can put some information in there for the first responders so that if I ever make a call, uh, there might be some information that says, you know, my, my adult son lives with autism and if you show up and you turn off the siren, he's gonna be a lot more calm when you walk in the door or, or, or my loved one is deaf. So he's not gonna to respond to your instructions because he's not hearing you. Some very basic things. Uh, and also, uh, of course, bringing in non-first responders before and after uh, the behavioral crisis. Okay. That's place-based. Uh, here, by the way, here's a map of all the group homes in Chicago where there's been uh, one of those uh, 911 type calls. I, I don't know who else has this map besides us. And, you know, it just, we need to have a systematic response to things like that. Uh, giving the mundane its due. Uh, so, you know, I'll just give you one more anecdote on this and then I'll, I'll show you some data. Uh, so I, I said that the police do a pretty good job if it's somebody talking to Jesus two o'clock in the afternoon in a low crime neighborhood. There was another case that I was hearing about when I was on the police accountability task force. Uh, there, was a, there was an older gentleman uh, who was sitting on his bed and it was, it was like a foldable couch, whatever. And, and he needed to go to a mental hospital. He was having, he was having acute symptoms. And there was a police woman there who was trained in uh, crisis intervention training. And she was talking to him uh, and helping him calm down so that he would come with her, uh, you know, in the patrol car so she could just drive him to the hospital. And, and she's doing an excellent job and he's becoming less agitated. Uh, but while they're having this conversation, 
her boss is behind her and his cell phone is going absolutely nuts because it's Ang the Englewood neighborhood of Chicago, which is a very high crime neighborhood of Chicago. And it's a Saturday night and there's texts coming in. Hey, where are you? There's a shooting over here. There's a, there's another issue over here. There's a, uh, there's all these service calls that you, you know, that you, that we need you. And at some point her boss charges past her and he tackles the man and he, and he cuffs him and he takes him away. And he basically says, uh, you know, I'm sorry, but I just didn't have the time to spend with, I, I couldn't spend another 45 minutes with you, uh, you know, dealing with this issue. We just, we just had other callers that, that we needed to get to. And uh, many of my progressive friends, I'm a, you'd be shocked to know I'm a liberal Democrat, uh, really don't like the idea of spending money to have a larger police force. But in the work like this, it's very, very labor intensive. And when you have more officers per crime available, it's actually a lot easier to treat people humanely who have mental health issues because you because you're not stretched in your resources, and so a lot of the failures just end up with things like, you know, police were just super busy and they and they just didn't have the time to allow that person to fully calm down and they used and therefore they were more coercive than they wanted to be. Uh, and uh, the other thing is the shortage of mental health resources and how, uh, and how that makes so many people in the system jaded. Uh, one of the things that was really frustrating to the officers that we talked to was there's somebody screaming in the street, that man that I told you about two o'clock in the afternoon in the street. So the officer does everything beautifully. They bring that guy to the hospital. They don't bring him to the Cook County Jail. And and then they come back three hours later and the same guy is there screaming at people again. And the other person just left against medical advice from the emergency department or whatever. And then the officer says, you know, at least if I take him to the jail, I know uh, that something's going to happen. And that issue facing the community, facing that person is going to be addressed. And, and I think that uh, that's just a real problem that we need. First responders have to know that there's going to be a effective uh, responses. And then I'll mention one other thing, which is the, the cultural status issues within the police department. Uh, anybody here familiar with Phil Goff's work? Uh, he's Dr. Phil, but a different Dr. Phil. Anyone uh, familiar with, uh, with, with Phil Goff? Let's see if uh, uh, no one's responding. Yeah, we have a, I, I know at least Dean um, and I on our team are familiar with Phil, but probably not everyone. So uh, Phil Goff does some really interesting work about honor and heroism, masculinity, cowardice within the police department. And you know, one of the things about the scenarios that I um, that I described is suppose that I'm a little bit insecure in my authority. You know, I'm Harold Puck. I'm a you can't see me, but I'm a five foot seven, 130 pound person. Uh, and suppose that there's this, and I suppose I'm an officer and there's a homeless older dude who's screaming at me and I'm being really gentle to him and I bring him in. Uh, you know, I, it's, it's not a challenge to me in any way that I'm being nice to this guy. But let's suppose that there's a muscular young man who's behaving the same way towards me and I'm a little bit insecure in my authority. It turns out that officers who are that in those situations, officers are more likely to escalate the situation because, because my own authority and masculinity and honor is at stake. And one of the interesting things that Phil found in role playing was that he found that really, really racist police officers who were really comfortable with their own authority often responded better uh, to situations involving young men of color who were behaving in this way than uh, much less uh, officers who scored much lower on a racism scale, but much higher on a sort of I'm insecure about my authority scale. And, uh, you know, it is, uh, and, you know, if I'm in an organization where if I subdue a violent suspect and I cuff him, I get high fives back at the station house and everybody's like, wow, that's pretty, that's pretty awesome. And, uh, you know, if, the, if that gets really rewarded, but if, um, if I talk somebody down and there's no violence and basically nothing happened, I took somebody to the hospital and, there was, uh, and, and my colleagues are like, well, that's boring. Uh, you can imagine what kind of an incentive system and status system that sets up for responding to people in ambiguous situations. So we're thinking about the culture of policing uh, in a way that gives greater reward to people uh, who, um, uh, 
who, who, who de-escalate. That, that's also an important part of the challenge that, that, that we face around the country. Uh, so let me go to some administrative data. So we looked at, we looked at mental and behavioral health events in, admin, in ambulance data from the Chicago Fire Department. And we did a, a lot of, of uh, term search text analyses. And we looked for words, you know, agitated, anxiety. Uh, we, had a, we had a set of words associated with mental health challenges that, that were in the patient complaints and also in the impressions that the EMS staff would write, you know, agitated or combative and a whole series of words ranging from you know, taser injury and so on. And we knew if police were on the scene, although there were a lot of data complexities I won't go into now. Uh, and we then linked uh, fire department and police data uh, and tried to understand what happened in these cases and what happened to other cases involving the same person uh, when we could identify the person. I should say, by the way, that uh, in all of this work, it, it, 80% of the work is, is the really boring uh, data cleaning, matching, and so on. You start out saying, you know, I, I'm wondering whether I should use this advanced algorithm versus that other advanced algorithm. And, and it turns out that, that the really, really important work is, is uh, you know, Jim Johnson uh, and James Johnson both, uh, uh, you know, were one of, James Johnson on the red line and Jim Johnson on the blue line both had an encounter with ambulance people. Is that the same guy or not? Uh, that actually turns out to be the real work. Or what if Johnson is misspelled? You know, that kind of thing. And so we, uh, so we have these events in the data. Uh, and we looked at how to predict what was a risk uh, for a negative event. And we had two different ways that we looked at this. First is we did the kind of traditional frequent flyer analysis. So, you know, if somebody had a lot of events in the past, was that predictive of a risk of having a behavioral crisis in the future? Uh, and that's pretty much what people, you know, the Camden work of many of you are probably familiar with a lot of work that tries to do this. We found that there were some real disadvantages to this frequent flyer approach. One is that uh, people have all sorts of weird issues that can lead to a burst of high use that often resolves. Uh, so they're actually not at risk for the future. Uh, but the second is that uh, a lot of the people who are these frequent flyers, they have, they have problems that don't particularly match uh, the kinds of interventions we're ready to provide for those people. Uh, and also we missed a lot of people who are at high risk, but who are yet to be the frequent flyer. For example, suppose somebody's institutionalized. Uh, you know, they have not been a frequent flyer because they've been, uh, they, haven't been, they haven't been exposed to the 911 system at all. And so we're, so we're, you know, we use machine learning and related techniques to look at those issues. And some of the folks that are uh, that are in this Zoom room are are more skilled than I am in the in, in the in these uh, uh, in these methods. Okay. So here's just this is just every you have to have a flowchart diagram of just this is a 911 call. There's a there's a somewhat complex uh, dispatch process that involves uh, 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 decision making about about which first responders to call and uh, uh, you know whether we send police, fire, or both. Uh, and you can imagine that understanding this flow is very, very important for understanding how we can improve this, this process. Uh, we came up, we, and we actually identified in the administrative data through, through calls that had come in through this process, we identified a lot of people. And I have some useful, although they're arbitrary, person-based identification approaches that we used. And first of all, we found 60,000 people who had been arrested and about 21,000 people who had a Chicago Fire Department mental health involved call and about 1,800 people who were kind of in the Venn diagram in the intersection there. And these were kind of the people that we were thinking about for proactive interventions. Okay. Uh, and uh, uh, and so, so we, we looked at these 800, 1,842 people who had, who had both had an arrest and also had had one of these behavioral health involved events. And then within that 1842, we also looked at people who we called high users within that, who were people who seemed to have lots of events that didn't seem to be resolving. And the, the, the particular arbitrary definitions that we picked aren't that interesting, but they basically had repeated events in different months. And we identified 330 people that were, that were in that group. 
And by the way, we, one of the best things that we did was we just looked through the data for each person and just tried to track every call we could find for that person. But this is, these are the kinds of presentations where when we gave it to the fire department, they would, often, they would often know who it was, even though we would try so hard to fuzz things. But here's a particular person's trajectory. Uh, my colleague Amy Spelman, by the way, thought of this visualization, which I like a lot. The, the top things are police uh, arrests, and the bottom things are uh, fire department mental health events. So, so this person, they have a misdemeanor arrest. I should say we've changed around the, the timing and so on. Uh, for confidentiality. This person had a misdemeanor arrest, harassed someone on the CTA, and then they had a retail theft at a grocery store. The most common crime in, a, in all of our data was shoplifting alcohol. And, and then by the most of the time when that occurred, people were not ultimately taken into custody. Uh, but that was very, very common where, you know, you, you know, somebody goes into Walgreens and tries to swipe, uh, tries to swipe alcohol and, you know, sticks a flask of alcohol. And us in here. And then on days 122 to 164, they have five arrests, one felony, and they also, there's lots of ambulance calls. Uh, this person's fairly typical in that they don't really wear a white hat or a black hat. There's things going on where you say, oh, this poor person needs, needs they're seeking medical care. They sometimes call the fire department and say, please take me to, I need help with addiction or with mental health. And then the same person also does something that might be scary uh, at the same time. So. Uh, uh, you know, these are, these are complicated people with complicated challenges. And then uh, they request rehab, transports to the ER, and then the person kind of disappears uh, in the data. And this, it's quite possible that they were in a secure facility out here. And we, we plotted up a bunch of people uh, for, these, uh, for these studies, particularly because we did intervention work. We wanted to understand who are we dealing with and are they safe for our staff to go and interact with. Uh, and so we actually, for those of you that want to see more, we wrote up in the American Journal of Public Health, uh, we published uh, an analysis of, of the people that we found through these, through these analyses. And, uh, uh, and a couple of things that we found, here's the top 10 people in Chicago that we could find in our data set. So person number one had 42 emergency events in a year, almost always with the fire department. They did get arrested five times, twice for felonies. Uh, and, uh, uh, and you can see that these are people that are, that, you know, they're, they're in regular contact with first responders, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, mostly fire. They're, they're not super, super dangerous people, actually. One of the ironies, if you look at the felony arrests, not too many. And there's one very basic reason for that, which is that if you're truly doing armed robberies and things like that, you're not going to be a frequent flyer because you're going to be in prison. And so these are people that are out, they have to be out in the community uh, in order for them to have these kinds of repeated events. Uh, we also looked at the top 10 places, a homeless shelter, a mental health facility. Uh, the airports turned out to be very big. You see two O'Hare airport uh, places and also Midway. And there's two reasons for that. One is that people go to the airport to sleep. And the second is that the airport's the end of the line on, on the transit lines. So all these stations here are the ends of, of, these, of transit lines. And we also saw Greyhound bus station, uh, one, one, one hospital. If I had a longer list, you would actually see police station houses. Quite a few of the calls actually came from police station houses when, when someone was in custody and then would become dysregulated. Police would call for mental health assistance. Uh, and so, so we wanted to know, could we use predictive analytics to serve people better? And so we actually identified a group of people and, and we went out and tried to, tried to serve them. Uh, this, by the way, is our, this is the obligatory SNASI predictive analytics slide. And all of the stuff that you'll learn in a class on machine learning is kind of all the stuff that's kind of over here. And it's like, should we use random forest and this kind of thing? 
this is all the easy part. The hard part is all, how do I link these data together? How do I deal with typos? What are the weird things about my data that, that might sneak the outcome into what appears to be, I think, I think it's an, a, a valid variable I can use to predict the outcome, but it's actually a, a variable that is, is biased because it was changed when the, by the outcome itself. Like one example would be uh, every time someone has a problem, suppose someone goes back and reinspects all their previous data and then cleans up obvious errors and then puts it back in the data set. You can imagine how that could create a weird bias. So this, this data pipeline is really what a ton of the work that, that CPL does, that Urban Labs does, uh, is really how do, we, how do we understand administrative data and put it into a form that we can use before we're ready to apply the fancy models to that. Is this, how many people um, in the audience do machine learning or something like that uh, in this context? or in any context. Anybody in the audience do this kind of work? Um, I can speak for CPL. I think we have um, arguably three to five people doing this right now, either on the translation side or on the actual data science pipeline. So it's there's such an art to it. And by the way, you guys are excellent. And the, the, the work that, that Brian and others have done you know, is very, very high quality. Uh, work and I aspire to achieve that same level of quality in, in the work that I do. The um, uh, but this is uh, but we, we we're trying to routinize this in a way that can be helpful for the city of Chicago. Uh, the um, uh, this uh, so so in this case we're using 911 call histories to predict uh, the future calls. This is actually uh, what's called a, uh, a, uh, a regression tree and. Uh, where we, where we try to put in a lot of predictors and then, and then come out with people who are, who are identified as having high probability of, uh, of a potential future risk. Uh, and actually, we also did the same when we, we, we did some machine learning with, uh, uh, with 911 calls, and we looked at how our machine learning algorithms compared with just what the dispatchers decided uh, based on what they were hearing. And we actually found that people who are 911 dispatchers are very good at their jobs. We, one of the things we were looking for was, did the dispatchers miss really dangerous cases that a predictive, that a, that a machine learning model would have found? And we found almost zero uh, in a year in the city of Chicago. It was actually amazing how effective the call dispatchers were in at least avoiding the error of missing uh, something that was really dangerous. You know, their sensitivity was amazingly high. You know, I, we found, we really found almost no calls where the model was saying, wow, this is really dangerous. And the dispatcher, uh, you know, uh, didn't pick that up, uh, which really, which was really, uh, which was actually quite heartening because the dispatchers, you know, that's their job. Uh, so we, we did a number, we were doing a number of work to try to understand, a number of analyses to try to understand different classification approaches that could help uh, the 911 system. Uh, and, and then we went out, we used in a pilot study, we actually went out and tried to find people. And uh, uh, we had, uh, we sent our own outreach workers out who would then try to refer people to mental health services through, through uh, thresholds. And, uh, uh, and we called this, this is Mental Health Emergency Alternatives and Referrals to Treatment, MHART. Uh, and uh, I won't say too, too much about that now, but I'll just say that we are trying to get people into assertive community treatment, uh, which Thresholds does quite a bit, where you come to the person and deliver mental health services. One of the real challenges with this population is you often tell people, you know, you really should come down to the mental health clinic for an appointment. And uh, all you have to do is take two buses to get down there, and it's actually kind of unpleasant to come, and a lot of people don't come. And ACT is really, uh, we're going to come out and find you and, help and serve you where you are. And I have incredible respect for the people who do ACT. Uh, there, uh, and so we did a pilot that was kind of a wild ride for all kinds of reasons. Uh, that, uh, because because so the data were HIPAA protected, ambulance data is actually personal health information. So there's a variety of constraints that come from that. Uh, it was kind of a wild ride in our pilot. Uh, 
and I must say, as the PI on the project, I was absolutely concerned about staff safety from day one to the day that it closed. And uh, and I must say, we had no our staff were amazing, uh, and they were safe. About a third of the individuals that came out of the predictive analytic. A uh, process we actually removed because we were concerned about safety or other issues. If someone had, say, a sexual uh, sexual assault or a weapons issue, something like that, we would we didn't include them in the pilot because we just didn't feel that we were equipped to serve them. Uh, and uh, as I, you know, as I mentioned, uh, you know, we had two women were our outreach team, uh, and and it was just an amazing experience. Uh, to just look through all of the files. Uh, as, as I mentioned before, I told you this Walgreen example, uh, people stealing this alcohol, socks, toiletries. It was also really striking how many people don't wear an entirely white hat or an entirely black hat when you really look at all their records. There was a young woman who shoplifted a lot and they were basically survival crimes and it was, you know, it really was not something that I was super concerned about. But one time she shoplifted and an elderly shopkeeper came out to try to protect his stuff and she, and she heard him. And all of a sudden, you know, there, if, you, if you shoplift, you create a risk that, you know, something bad is gonna happen. And I should say, we're now, we're now working on how to follow up this pilot and also how to improve the machine learning and make more sophisticated uh, use of, the, of the, uh, the text that's available from the EMS folk and from other folk. Uh, Right now, we're mainly looking for keywords, but there's we can natural language processing gives us some chances to do some things that are that are more sophisticated. Uh, and I must say, we've learned so much from this pilot. I'm so happy that we didn't jump into recommend any particular intervention without piloting because we would have made any number of mistakes. Uh, I would say uh, just a few early lessons that that don't just apply from our work, but it come from the literature. I should say one is. A lot of people are hard to find that are the people you're the most interested in. And so one of the things that we are thinking about a lot is if someone is too dangerous to go out and find, is there a way that when they come to you that they could be identified and served? So that person who, uh, who had a weapons charge at some point, and so you didn't want to send so an outreach worker out to with what we had to offer, the next time they come into the emergency department, can they be flagged and have someone serve them in the emergency department? How can we do that better? How can we use Medicaid more effectively? Medicaid has so much data on people and has so many services that we could provide. Uh, unfortunately, Medicaid is a really troubled program, particularly in Illinois. Uh, the assertive community treatment providers have a really, really hard time paying their bills with the kinds of reimbursement that Medicaid provides. And I, I hope that California can do a better job just because it has a more professional Medicaid program. Uh, it's really discouraging talking to people, um, uh, describing how just how, what a terrible customer Medicaid is. And particularly for this population, it's very, very expensive and challenging to deal with this population. And, if, and, and we have to make that a viable business model for mental health providers. Uh, there, the other thing I would say about assertive community treatment is it reminds me, as a Jewish atheist, I like to quote the New Testament. And one of my favorite, uh, and, and Christian uh, preaching, one of my favorite uh, sayings is from St. Francis, always preach the gospel, only when necessary use words. And the most effective recruitment strategies for the people we were interested in uh, had nothing to do with telling people that they required mental health services. It was showing up and saying, hey, I care about you. What can I do? Uh, to make your life a little bit better. Do you need a sandwich or a pair of socks? Uh, you know, creating a relationship and then, and then say, oh, okay, you know, uh, now that we have this relationship, are there, some, are there some mental health services that we might be able to connect you to that could help you? You know, we see that you've had some challenges. It's amazing how effective those kind of low-tech things are. Uh, and uh, the other thing I'll, I'll sort of end with is, I think we put so much attention on improving the police and ambulance response. And that is so overrated in terms of, it's critically important, but that is just never gonna get the job done with this population. We have to find ways to engage mental health services, medical and social services for these folks when they're not in crisis, instead of trying to figure out new ways to manage the crisis better. 
Now, I do think the first response data is very helpful because it helps us understand who are these people and what are their issues. But we need to put it, we need to put more emphasis on the before and after and a little bit, uh, you know, no, not, not that we should put less emphasis on how to do the first response right, but let's not uh, put, be overconfident about what improved first response is really going to give us in this domain. So uh, I'm going to say thank you, and I'm going to stop my screen sharing. And I'm going to, uh, if I can, I'd like to have a conversation. So uh, uh, did, I, would, did, did what I say make any sense? I, was, I don't remember any of my talk. Now that I've delivered it, Any, anybody have any questions or, or comments that they'd like to uh, uh, that they'd like to share in the conversation? Carol, thanks so much for spending the time to go through that. Um, it was really fascinating, and I hope people will submit questions in the chat function unless they want to just raise their hand and we can call on you and have you speak and unmute but, you. But Nathan stands so still. I don't know how you do that, Nathan. You must be <laughs> into meditation or something. <laughs> Uh, uh, question? So uh, does your work take the role of institutional racism within policing into account when explaining, when examining the impact of emergency first response? Uh, the role of institutional racism, uh, it's something we think about a lot but whether we have effectively addressed it is another question. I think it definitely is present in a variety of ways. Uh, it is present, uh, it's present in the resources available to each community when there is a mental health crisis. As I mentioned, uh, are predominantly white communities that happen to have uh, SROs and happen to have a pretty high concentration of people with mental health challenges, but are pretty low crime and otherwise pretty quiet police districts. Uh, the police response is, is, is more modulated than it would be in a place where the crime rate was a lot higher as a community of color and where the police are just more stretched. Now, and that is, I don't know if I would use the term institutional racism to describe that, but I would say the disparities across a city like Chicago or Los Angeles really make themselves felt uh, you know, in that way. Uh, and I, I do think that a young man of color, in, not in Chicago particularly, but in any city who is behaviorally dysregulated is more likely to be viewed as, as a criminal threat uh, than a young man who's not of color, who's more likely to be coded as this person seems to be having a mental health crisis. And I do, uh, I do worry about that. I think that particularly when you have the ambiguous cases, there's a lot of people who could be arrested who are not because of the way they behave towards police. And when those judgment calls are made, it would not surprise me if we found that, that implicit biases and, uh, and institutional racism uh, played a role. I think, you know, it's in a case where somebody's really being actively quite violent or something like that, it's much less ambiguous. It's probably less, less of an issue. Uh, there, yeah, Harold, if, if, you, if you wouldn't mind, if I could just take a minute to sure. add to that, um, from, sure. from experience working on these issues in Chicago, one, one of the fascinating dynamics that was happening with CPD at the time with responses to behavioral health incidents is that elected officials had requested that more police be assigned to higher crime districts, which tended to be in minority areas. And yeah. as Harold said earlier in his talk, that may seem counterintuitive, but it actually tends to protect people more if you have more people who can spend more time thinking through how to respond. However, what had gone completely unmonitored by leadership was the ratio of supervisors to line officers. And in some of these terrible incidents that involve people with behavioral health issues, they had the right number of officers on patrol and they had a tiny, tiny fraction of the supervisors, sergeants and lieutenants who should have been supervising those people. And it's often the more experienced people who've been working for many years who have better instincts about how to handle these situations. And when they are able to show up at the scene, they're the ones directing the patrol officer's behavior, right? And so when you, the, the mm -hmm. Betty Jones shooting in particular, mm -hmm. I think they had hundreds of officers on duty or it was around the Christmas holiday and there was, I think one or two sergeants in the entire west side of Chicago. So 
it's and, and the reason for that, by the way, is that senior officers under the under the union contract can select to work in the areas that they want to work in first. And so they were all opting to work into, um, you know, lower crime, whiter neighborhoods, frankly. And so and no one was paying attention to this. And it's the type of sort of structural racism that affects minority communities. So um, this these kinds of things take a while, I think, to understand how they're all fitting together the end result being these tragedies that, uh, that affect minority communities. By the way, I think it's also important to make sure that those officer leaders are with the program with things like CIT, because one of the challenges that you can have is the new officers can get excellent training on these things in the academy. And if they get out on the street and if the officers that are training them say, okay, kid, you, this is what you learned in the textbook, but here's, here's what it's really like in the street. And then they present a very different message. That's going to come, that's going to really, uh, undermine your ability to to uh, to say uh, encourage a particular kind of de-escalation, something like that. Absolutely. So, a, so I my name is Millicent Robinson, and I'm the one who posed that question, uh, and so I uh, wanted to clarify a piece of it. Hi, okay. Sorry, I don't have it on my video, but um, I'm actually a PhD student in the Department of Community Health Sciences here, but I'm also a trained social worker, and so that's how like that's why I wanted to ask that question. Mm -hmm. um, and Great specifically, question. I'm thinking, thank you, and just thinking about even like the role having like social workers be on the front lines versus policing, um, because I do definitely think like institutional structural racism plays a huge role in even mm -hmm. what's portrayed as like a high crime area versus a low crime area and that type of thing. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's why I wanted to gain um, a little bit more clarification from you all about like how like even if it's not being addressed right now like is there even a plan to figure out how to address that within it because racism is the root cause of a lot of issues mm -hmm. and so just thinking about if it's not addressed like how can we move forward from that you know for me the, the when you mentioned by the way i teach at the school of social service administration and i think social workers rock and there's so mm -hmm. many things that social workers can do to be helpful there's the there's the co-response model with social workers and police and those kinds of issues, but there's also why wasn't there a social worker involved with that person a month before the crisis hit, you know, or a month after, and you know the the very very often the real the there are a lot of social service failures that uh, that that we need to address. You know, as, you know when we have uh, congregate housing situations where where men with mental illness might be uh, uh, living together and sometimes under you know less than uh, best practice circumstances, where where are the social service agencies in addressing those issues and uh, not just uh, not just when there's a violent encounter, but for a lot of other things that go wrong. And you know there's this idea that we can have public safety without a strong social services sector, and and you know it's really that's very problematic because if the first time you ever have a relationship with a social worker is because I got in a fist fight with my brother, that's very different from they were serving my needs before that happened. And then this happened and now how do we deal with it? So there's other questions. I'll go to them, but, but I, I completely, uh, I think what you're doing is important and uh, many faceted. So let me see. There's Thank two. You. You're welcome. So the, I love the thought about engaging individuals using human-centered approaches rather than you've been predicted to need the service. Uh, given increased interest in using predictive analytics to provide uh, services, can you speak more about your thought for outreach here? Uh, see, say, for example, for homeless prevention services. Uh, that's a great question, and I, I actually think there's a you can imagine there's this very serious acceptability and confidentiality and privacy issue around showing up and saying, you just rang the bell on our predictive analytic algorithm. Uh, one thing I would say is a lot of people come to us and we can, like with say homelessness prevention, we can predict a lot of people who might be homeless because they're calling up a homeless, they're, they're, they're calling up a financial assistance line and they're saying, hey, I need help. And so there's, there's certainly things we can do other than the predictive analytics. I think that a lot of the people that, we can do a lot with predictive analytics for people who are already in care and prioritizing who should get uh, particular intensive services. So we have, suppose that we know that we have a risk score for people. 
Uh, let's think about maybe we need to have our best social workers with a somewhat lower caseload assigned to the people that our predictive algorithms suggest are in the greatest uh, need. So that doesn't involve coming to that person and saying, hey, we've identified you as an outlier or whatever. It's just, it's just saying, let's bring our A game to that person and see if that helps. I think there's a lot we can do with people that in inreach rather than outreach, with people that are already, and, and certainly Janie and others here have been quite involved in some of those efforts. And uh, uh, so there's a lot we can do that, that, is, that is just high quality service delivery that uses these tools so that when we interact with people, we are cognizant, hey, this guy has a high risk of homelessness. He's here for his snap visit about some mundane thing, but, not, but since he's here, let's make sure we do X, Y, Z. Let me go to the next question. In relation to these issues, how do you think about skepticism toward official authorities intervening in private matters of the family, which may explain why we observe more conflict happening within family than between strangers, or concerns by individuals and their significant others about public labeling of individuals vulnerable to stigmatization and social media attention? Uh, it's a huge, it's a huge problem. Uh, there, um, uh, the, it is, I think it is, I think that we have to show people, it's a show don't tell thing for public, for our law enforcement system, I would say. We have to show that we can respond to calls for service that come in through these mechanisms, or we can respond when people, when people are identified at risk, we help those people and the people involved know that we behaved in a way that, that, that helped them. And, you know, if the stories that come out on social media are, I was really nervous about calling the police about my son. And then the police came and they were actually really, really understanding with my son. And I was really appreciative of the officers in the way that they, uh, uh, you know, he was cursing at them and they, and they were restrained and I felt safer and the police did their job. You know, if that's what they're putting up on the family Facebook thing for, uh, you know, whatever the, whatever the issue is for their child, that's so much more powerful than anything else we can do. So, you know, I think it's, it's, I do think there's a lot of luck in this. Sometimes police, uh, you know, sometimes official interventions go badly, but uh, I think we just have to show people that they, that, that we are worthy of their trust. Uh, and that's, and there's no shortcut to that. Are there, are there other questions? Have I exhausted everyone? Am I talking too fast? I think I, I may have, uh, uh, I think I may have uh, run out of your patience. Uh, uh, anything I should, Janie, anything that I should have talked about that I didn't? Or things that I talked about that I shouldn't have? <laughs> I can't think of anything in, in either of those categories. I just wanted to say thank you again for all of our colleagues at UCLA for taking the time to do this. And we look forward to continuing to work with you on, on a lot of these types of projects. Well, thank you for having me. And I think you guys have such a special uh, university public policy partnership at a great university. And uh, I'm just very jealous that, that uh, for all the challenges you guys have in California, that you have, you have some tools that I wish that we had. And I love what you've accomplished uh, in the work that you do. And uh, so I'll, 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 I guess I'll leave it there. Thanks, Harold. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. so much for having me. Thank you.